Lord God, Father, with all our getting to get understanding that we are changed on the inside out. Beyond the storm, beyond the trial. Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to our sit-ups. Spiritual Impact Training Using Prayer and Scripture. I'm Tony Burke Brown, your Spiritual Impact Trainer. Welcome to my Spiritual Fitness Channel where we come Monday through Friday with the Word so that we can grow, change, progress, be impacted by the Word, and impact the world. This is about spiritual growth and maturity, getting understanding, wisdom, knowledge, and getting this Word, the wisdom of God, so we can apply it to our life, so we can teach it to others, so that we can walk in power and authority, so that we can draw nearer to God that He draws nearer to us. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we desire this sincere milk of the word, the strong meat. We want this nourishment. We want to grow thereby. And so if this is your first time joining us, on my spiritual fitness channel. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you're already a part, welcome back. Get your pen, get your paper, get your highlighter, get your Bible, your electronic device, whatever you need so that you can look at the scriptures along with us. Write down any notes that you may have that you may want to go back and do your own study with. We are going to continue our study. We're talking about Daniel. We're seeing how you can be in the midst of a perverse place, a perverse world, a perverse community, a perverse generation, and still yet not compromise. Still yet, we are learning principles from Daniel. And so today we are beginning in Daniel chapter 5. We're going to go through verses 1 through 12, if you want to write that down. And we're going to look at today the handwriting on the wall. Let's open up in prayer and get right into it. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name. We honor and praise you, worship you, and glorify you. God, we come today hungry and thirsty for the living word. Father, the bread of life, the living water, spiritual nourishment so we can grow, so we can produce spiritual fruit, be led by your spirit, grow in wisdom and knowledge. And with all of our getting, we pray that we get understanding. Let it not be in vain, but let it be that your Holy Spirit is our teacher, bringing forth sound doctrine, the truth, the word of God, that we would receive it with gladness, hide it in our heart and meditate on it day and night, that we would apply it to our life and that we would make our way prosperous and have good success. According to Joshua, chapter one. We honor you and praise you. We thank you, God, for who you are, all that you've done, what you're doing, and what you're about to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Daniel chapter five. We're beginning in verse one. We're going to go through the first 12 verses. We're talking about the handwriting on the wall. Have you ever heard that? It's an idiom, and it basically is a warning. It is a presentiment, presentiment of danger, right? It is like, um, you know, Something that is 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 letting us know, like whatever we're doing, it could be a behavior that we have. Something that we're doing, it's like people will say, "I saw the handwriting on the wall," because you see certain things happening. Something that is showing you that danger is coming, that there's a warning, that somebody is gonna fail, that something bad is gonna happen, because you see something that is leading up to that. Sometimes it's something that somebody is doing, and you're just like. You should have saw the handwriting on the wall. I saw the handwriting on the wall when they were doing this, when that was happening, when this was going, you know, about it. You know, when they were saying this, I saw, did you see, you should have saw the handwriting on the wall. You should have known that was coming, right? And so today we are looking at where this probably originated, right? Because it is in Daniel chapter five, verse one. Remember when we left off, we were in chapter four and we were talking about, um, Nebuchadnezzar and his pride and exalting himself and the consequences of it and what he needed to do in order for him to rise back up, right? But now we are getting to a point where Nebuchadnezzar is dead. So now we begin in verse one. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar Whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels, which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes his wives and his concubines drank in them. Now, let's first of all look at the fact that this is after Nebuchadnezzar. You got Belshazzar, this king, right? 
Uh, he has this great feast, but this feast, as we read, is a riotous feast. This is an idolatrous feast. This is when you look at this, these verses of scripture, they're sitting there and they are drinking. And then he is sending for uh, the gold and silver vessels that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple of Jerusalem. So these are things that are dedicated to God and he wants them so that the king and his princes, his wives and concubines can drink in them. Right. And so they bring the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of God, uh, the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem and the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines, they drank in them. So already we see that this is not going in a good direction. So when we look in verse four and it says they drank wine, praise the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood and of stone. So now we are looking at idolatry. First of all, they are defiling something that belongs to God. Secondly, they are praising false gods, gods of gold and silver, brass, iron, wood and of stone. And so now this is idolatry. We know that God hates idolatry. God is a jealous God. God is the creator of all heaven, earth, the sea, and the fullness thereof. So even though there are many that don't follow God, don't acknowledge God, he's still the creator of them, right? And so he hates idolatry. Um, it is worshiping false gods, putting other, others before God, worshiping things instead of worshiping God, worshiping the creation instead of the creator. So here they are, and they're worshiping and praising false gods. In verse five, it says, in the same hour, came forth fingers of a man's hand. Imagine this. You are sitting there already. They're probably crazy out of their mind because they're sitting there and they're drinking. So then you see this hand. It's like these fingers come forth of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the place, uh, plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Imagine that you're sitting there if you were still in the world, sitting there drinking, right? And then you just see some fingers of a hand and begins to write on the wall, like against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Listen, verse six. Then the king's countenance was changed, like his face changes because before they're praising false gods, they're drinking, he's having a good time. He got the gold and silver and everything from, you know, the, the vessels that were from the temple that was taken from Jerusalem. And now all of a sudden his face changes, his countenance changes, his attitude changes. And it says his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one another. Now, um, listen, it's a whole nother thing when you begin to look at something, you know, that's, that's crazy. That doesn't make sense. There's a fear that can come over you. What this says in the Amplified in verse six is then the king's face grew pale. His thoughts alarmed him, the joints and muscles of his hips and back weakened and his knees began knocking together. Now, this is a fear. He's not celebrating anymore. The celebration has been interrupted. The party has been interrupted. So when we look in verse seven, the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. The king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet, have a chain of gold about his neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. So he's promising promotion, gold chain, clothed in scarlet. He is promising, if you can read this, if you can explain this, if you can interpret this, if you can tell me what the handwriting on the wall means, right? If you can tell me, I'm going to give you something great. I'm going to make you great right? And we know that promotion comes from God. So, so keep that in mind, right? Is that he's promising a promotion, right? To whoever can do this. And he's called in astrologers, Chaldean soothsayers, and he causes, calls the wise men of Babylon. Now, if you follow us on our master's class on my Facebook and Instagram, you'll know that previous and while I'm doing this message, right, we have been doing a study 
um, in our master's class on wisdom and foolishness and wise and foolish and the difference, but also looking at the difference between the wisdom of God, which the word um, that that uh, is used for the wisdom of God is also uh, the interpretation of it means spiritual intelligence, right? And so, um, I'm sorry, it, it supreme intelligence, supreme intelligence, right? And so, when you are talking about wise men of Babylon, a place where they're worshiping false gods, their wisdom is foolishness. The wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. So, he's calling in the wise men of Babylon, but they're not going to be able to do what only... You know, this is a message from God. So God is going to, right, make sure that who he wants to interpret it will be the only one that will be able to interpret this. So no matter what the king promises, he can't make anybody be able to interpret this unless God okays it because it's God's message. So by the time we get to verse eight, it says, then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Again, the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. They are wise according to uh, they are their idolatrous ways. Babylon, a heathen place, right? Their wisdom is foolishness to God. They can't interpret something spiritual from God. When they are living an idolatrous life, the, 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 the thing that you want to get from just these two verses alone is the fact that when we follow after the ways of the world, things that God wants us to know, we won't be able to figure it out because we're operating with a carnal mind. The Bible tells us if you think that you're wise according to the world, become a fool so you can be wise. So some things you have to unlearn in order to be able to understand the things of God and see the things of God and have wisdom to walk in the things of God, to have understanding, to gain knowledge. And so there's some things you have to unlearn and undo. And as long as we are focused on things of this world and worshiping the wrong things and people and places and, and walking in opposition to God, there's some things that you're just not going to know. There's some things that unbelievers can't understand. There's some things that lukewarm Christians can't walk in. There's power that people can't obtain because they are straddling the fence, lukewarm, backslidden, or have totally turned away from God, or they just don't acknowledge God at all. In those cases, trying to gain spiritual wisdom and God's favor is foolishness. And so when we look in verse nine, then was the king Belshazzar greatly troubled and his countenance was changed in him and his lords were astonished. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords came into the banquet house and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let your countenance be changed. There's a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods was found in him. Whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, your father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astro astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard uh, sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will show the interpretation. Now, there's a couple of things here. First of all, we want to remember that promotion comes from God. The king has promised a promotion to whoever interprets this. God has made it so that because this is God's message, only God's person is going to be able to interpret it. Not those that have the wisdom of the world of Babylon, a heathen place, worshiping false gods. They're not going to get revelation from the one and only true God. And so, but the other thing is this, many have learned to promote themselves to say, well, I do this and I can do that. And I know how to do this and want to be seen and want to be praised and want to be elevated. But remember that promotion comes from God. The word says it in Psalm 75. You got to know that promotion comes from God. Elevation comes from God. When we elevate ourselves, it doesn't last. 
is dependent on our ability and us being able to try to keep favor with people and all these different things that are going to perish is going to change. But when we wait on God and humble ourselves and just do what God tells us to do, we're not trying to get the praise of men. We're not trying to be promoted. We're not trying to be acknowledged. We're not trying to get honor of people, but just being obedient to God, letting him use us as vessels and instruments, God will uh, 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 will exalt you. And we talked about that in the last lesson as it relates to Nebuchadnezzar trying to take credit for what God had done. I say all this because only Daniel was going to be able to interpret this. But Daniel wasn't walking around, right? Like, I interpreted dreams. I did this. I interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. I have this gift. I'm able to do this. I'm so wise. I got all this knowledge. Look at my position. I got promoted in Babylon. I ain't even supposed to be here. And, you know, and all of these different things. He didn't boast in himself. He didn't promote himself. He didn't go around advertising what he did and how he did it. What he did was just what God told him to do. He was faithful where he was. He had purpose in his heart. He wouldn't defile his body. He gained the wisdom and knowledge of God and gave God the credit. He praised God. He acknowledged God. So when we look at this, I want us to understand that even though the king was like, I'm offering this promotion and this uh, uh, garments, the scarlet and the gold chain to whoever can interpret this, it wasn't going to make people of the world, the heathen people, the idolatrous people be able to operate in the power of the one and only true God and interpret his word. So you be careful of false teachers and false prophets and false doctrines of people that have promoted themselves, called themselves, and now they're going out twisting the word of God because they really don't have understanding. They really don't have the spiritual discernment to teach the word of God properly. So they're teaching whatever their carnal mind gives them that is fit for only itching ears and to minister to the flesh instead of the spirit. So now we have at this point that none of these wise men or astrologers, Chaldeans or soothsayers, none of them are going to get this promotion from interpreting this dream because God has made it so they're blind to it. They don't understand it. They can't read it. They can't interpret it. He shut them up so that they have an inability to speak what God is saying. And so promotion for Daniel or the ability for Daniel is because of God. The queen came in and promoted Daniel. Daniel didn't promote himself. The queen came in because when you're doing what God says, God is the one that makes people know who you are if you need to be known, if he wants to use you for something, if he has a position for you, a place for you, your gift makes room for you. When God has something for you to do, you don't have to chase after it. You have to seek after him. Be faithful where he placed you. If you're reminded of Joseph, when Joseph was promoted to the palace, it wasn't because, right, that he promoted himself. In fact, when he went through all the stages and went through all the trials sold out by his brothers, becoming Potiphar's servant, lied on by Potiphar's wife, put in prison, right? Wrongfully. And then he interprets the baker and the, and the butler's dream while he's in prison. The one that lived, he said, remember me when you're restored in your position. But he didn't remember Joseph. Excuse me, he forgot him. For two years, he forgot him. Why? Because we are not going to be able to say so-and-so promoted me, so-and-so, you know, praised me, so-and-so, you know, put me in this position, so-and-so. You know, Joseph said, remember me, but he wasn't remembered. He was forgotten. And then when God was ready for him to be promoted, when God was ready to present him, when God was ready to use him, then he let him be remembered. Then you know, he was spoken to up to the Pharaoh and he was able to go forth before the Pharaoh and interpret his dream and be promoted because it was God's work. It was God's plan. It was God's purpose. It's never for us to be promoted. It's never for us to be praised. It's for us to do the will of God. And as God decides to promote or to elevate as we're able to handle it, when it's his timing and when it's for his glory and his purposes, that's when God will do it. Just do what you're supposed to do. I don't care what it is. Oftentimes people are learning to promote themselves in everything they do, not just ministry and everything. 
I'm the greatest. I'm the best. I'm this. I'm that. Blah, blah, blah. And just like I say, when we have our master's class, you know, during the week on my social media classes, that's why it's the master's class. It's his class. People, they they, they feel that they're experts in things and, and they know this and they know that. But the thing is, is that then they have a master class and it is them being the master and the expert, which is fine. I'm not knocking it. But what I'm saying is, is that God is the true master. So when you're teaching his word, when you're hearing his word, it's the master's class. It's going to cover your job, your business, your home. It's going to cover your ministry, your walk, your behavior, your relationships, your decisions, your mindset, your healing, your deliverance. Everything is dependent on God's word. It's the master's class. And so when you look at Daniel, he was doing the will of God in the midst of a, a perverse people idolaters, but he didn't commit idolatry. Those that, you know, would defile their body, but he wouldn't defile his body. They were worshiping idols, but he wouldn't worship idols. So he was able to stand on his faith and God could use him. So he didn't promote himself, but the wife the, the, or the, the queen came into the king and said, Hey, your father, Nebuchadnezzar, he knew this man, this Daniel, who he named Belshazzar. He, he's wise. He has knowledge. He has understanding. She said he has an excellent spirit. This word excellent, right, is supreme. And remember, I was saying that in our master's class um, that we have in the mornings, we were talking about wisdom, right? And one of the definitions for wisdom was supreme intelligence. So when you think of an excellent spirit is one that is just doing the will of God, submitted to him, is supreme, it is above, it is beyond, it is good, it is excellent because it is about God. And so when you think of that, you think of Daniel as one that is walking in the will of God, that God has given him wisdom and knowledge and understanding so he can interpret dreams so that he can, you know, explain, you know, and, and dissolve doubt, she was saying, and, and, and showing of heart sentences. He could, he could, you know, whether it was a riddle, whatever it was, he was able to interpret it because of the favor of God, because of his excellent spirit, because he was surrendered to God. So when you think about an excellent spirit. I want to look at another definition for that word excellent. Um, if you will look at uh, Proverbs 27 verse 2 and write that down as well, because this is another excellent spirit that is spoken of in the Bible. And I want to look at what that means, because, you know, we have talked about, like I said, we've been studying about wisdom and being wise, right? And in going through that, we learn that you should be an expert, right? In the word and how to use it, how to walk in it. You want to be an expert in the knowledge of God, not the knowledge of this world, not the wisdom of this world. You know, there's a lot of things that people want to be experts in and specialists in. But if you could just be a specialist in this word, if you could just be an expert in applying it and speaking it and living it and standing on it and sharing it, this is above everything. The wealth of wisdom doesn't compare to any perishable thing in this world. So when we look at Proverbs, um, I'm sorry, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Where did I tell you go? First of all, okay, first of all, we look at Proverbs 27 and 2 since I already said that. This is to remind you that you don't have to pump up yourself. God will elevate you as he see fit. Because this is what Proverbs 27 and 2 says. Let another man praise you and not thine own mouth, a stranger and not thine lips. So it's not you promoting yourself. The queen is the one that was talking about Daniel. Daniel wasn't talking about Daniel. But again, it opened up a door. He was, you know, they came to Nebuchadnezzar. You know, Daniel can do it because nobody else was able to do it. So the thing is, is that with Nebuchadnezzar and with Belshazzar, um, somebody else came and told them about Daniel, right? Somebody else told Pharaoh about Joseph. So we have to trust God that God is able to bring it to pass. He's able to place us where he desires us to be. We just have to follow. But then the other verse, Proverbs 17, 27. Proverbs 17, 27, where we were talking about an excellent spirit. Proverbs 17, 27, write it down. This is a video. You can always pause it if you need to. It says, he that hath knowledge spares his words and a man of understanding 
is of an excellent spirit. Again, excellent spirit. This word right here is a Hebrew word. Q-A-R. It's pronounced car, right? This word means cool. It means chill. And so it means quiet. It's so when you think about this word, right? This word is like you got a cool spirit. Like you are, you're not in the world they're talking about. Just chill, cool out, calm down. See, when you have an excellent spirit, you have self-control. When you have an excellent spirit, you are able to operate, right, um, with an even temper. You're not easily uh, aroused. You're not easily provoked. You have self-control. You have an even temper because you're chill, because you're cool. And then because you're led by the spirit of God, because you have the word of God in you, because you're submitted to the king, you're submitted to his authority. And so when you think about that, and even in him being using us and the gifts that he's given us, it's because of an excellent spirit that he's able to use us when we're just surrendered to the spirit of God. I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know what God wants. Whatever God wants me to do, I'm going to just do it. I'm going to just trust him. Chill out. Be cool. Submit to his authority. Right? Every, in everything, even in spiritual battle. Right? You submit yourself, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil and he flees. Right? Excellent spirit. When God tells you to do something and the world is doing something else, you operate with an excellent spirit, self-control. You are able to do what God says. You're not pompous. You're not pumping yourself up. You're not prideful. You're not haughty. You're not promoting yourself. You are praising God. You're honoring God. You're living for God. You're led by his spirit. You're walking in his word. You're submitted to his truth. You're not afraid of the threats. You're not, you know, focused on others. You're not following peer pressure. You're not people pleasing. You're just chilling. You're just cool. You just operate with an excellent spirit. So I want you to go back and meditate on those first 12 verses of scripture and think about the handwriting on the wall, right? Think about what they were doing because when we come back, we're going to talk about what that handwriting was and what it means. And we're going to talk about what it is, you know, um, that is before him. And what we need to understand is that there's consequences when we are committing idolatry, when we are living riotous rights, uh, lifestyles, and the handwritings are on the wall. Really, the handwriting is in this book, right? But the thing is, is that there's consequences. But also, like there's consequences to certain behaviors. There's also elevation, promotion from being submitted. The Bible says, humble yourself under God's mighty hand and he will exalt you in due season. So you ain't got to praise yourself. Don't let it come out of your mouth that you think you're great. Let it come out of somebody else's mouth if it's going to come out of a mouth. Don't let it be yours. Don't promote yourself. Promote God. Don't praise yourself. Praise God. The word says if you're going to boast in anyone, boast in him. Amen. We're going to close out right now. Um, and when we come back, we're going to go back into chapter five and see what is this handwriting on the wall. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name and honor you. We praise you and we worship you, God. Help us to get this word hide it in our heart to walk in it. Help us, Lord God, that we're not praising and boasting in ourselves, but we are boasting in you. We are honoring you. We magnify you. We exalt your name together. We lift you up because you're the great I am and you're worthy of all praise and glory and honor. You said you won't let anyone steal your glory. And so, Father, we yield ourselves to you and humble ourselves under your mighty hand. Lord God, Father, help us not to walk idolatrous. Lord God, Father, seeking after your creation. Lord God, Father, instead of after you. Help us not to place anyone or anything before you or ahead of you, but Father, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth to keep our minds stayed on you and our eyes fixed on Christ. We love you. We honor you. We praise you, God, for who you are and all that you've done and what you're doing and what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Don't forget to join us Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for our master's class and on Saturdays at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for our master's class. Facebook and Instagram Live. Tony Brooke Brown. God bless you. Have an amazingly blessed day in the Lord. It's time for sit ups. All sit ups. Spiritual impact training using prayers and scripture.